All right, we're going to look at Matthew 28 together, continuing our, our series here in the month of May, talking about evangelism. I love the month of May because that's when new things start growing. Anybody notice the farmers in the fields lately? Some of you might be farmers. Maybe you have a, your own little farm. It's called a garden. Anybody planting their garden this past week or two? Getting it ready to go? That's, that's fun. Some of you kids are just like, oh, I can't even lift my arm because my parents worked me to death. <laughs> no. Uh, it's exciting to watch new things grow. It's exciting to see new life where over the winter it was just a dead lump of ground there. Even the old plants, the stalks were still there, but you get that rototiller gone, you get that plow gone, and it just makes everything new. And then, as, as we see just down the road, I was looking the other day, and I hope the frost didn't get it, but one of the farmers down here planted pretty early, and I saw some corn about that high already, and I thought, man, this is exciting. I love this time of the year, because new things are happening. I believe that in God's kingdom, at the local church level, that new things ought to always be happening. Don't you? It ought to always be springtime, always planting, always growing, always reaping, always planting, always growing, always reaping. And uh, that's what Jesus was talking about after his resurrection. We find in Matthew 28, uh, verse 16 through verse 20, it says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going uh, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Again, just to tie these last couple of weeks together with this one, understand that when Jesus gives the promise in Matthew 28, verse 20, he's saying that as you do these things, as you are committed to making disciples, I will be with you. In other words, if you are not interested in making disciples, if you're not interested in spreading the gospel at all with your life and letting God use you, however he chooses to use you, it may not be preaching, it may not be teaching, but in whatever avenue of ministry he has for your life, and trust me, he has one for your life. There's someone, some way that God wants you to minister to. Um, But as you do this thing, as you surrender to him and say, God, use me however you want to use me, he will be with you always, even to the end of the age. A common scripture that we use when talking about revival and talking about seeing God do great things is 2 Chronicles 7.14. Some of you can probably quote this from your, from your memory. I'm going to read this in a New Living Translation. It says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and for, will forgive their sins and restore their land. We need God to do that, don't we? How will that happen? It happens when God supernaturally, through his church, does a work that changes our community, which changes our nation, changes our society, changes the world for his glory. Uh, J. Hudson Taylor said this about revival, and today we're talking, by the way, if you haven't already noticed, we're talking about um, the role of prayer in evangelism, prayer in evangelism how that prayer causes and sparks and builds evangelism to happen, and it happens organically or naturally. But J. Hudson Taylor said this, Do not have your concert first and then tune your instruments afterwards. That's probably enough right there, right? Anybody seen churches do that? He says, Begin the day with the word of God in prayer and get first of all into harmony with him. Sometimes when it we talk about evangelism, we talk about reaching the lost, we sometimes are starting to play the concert before we even tune the, tune the, the instrument. God, help me to know how and what. Rather than just doing something, we need to do the right thing, what he leads us to do. C.T. Studd, very straightforward preacher of years gone by, said this, we Christians too often substitute prayer for the, playing the game. Prayer is good, But when used as a substitute for obedience, it is nothing but a blatant hypocrisy, a despicable Phariseeism. To your knees, man, and to your Bible, 
Decide at once. Don't hedge. Time flies. Cease your insults to God. Quit consulting flesh and blood. Stop your lame, lying, and cowardly excuses. Enlist. You can almost hear him almost spitting as he says that. Enlist. The passion, the power, the zeal. God is calling us to a life that takes that determination. He wants to enlist us in his efforts for revival. We're going to talk about revival uh, a little bit deeper in just a moment, but understand that prayer and revival are absolutely mutually exclusive. You cannot have a revival without prayer. If God's people don't pray, God's spirit doesn't move. Amen? Have you found that to be true in your own life? We're talking about this on a global setting, in the church setting, in this community. But even in my own personal life, God does nothing new in my life that I do not invite him to do. Amen? He does nothing new in my life that I don't ask him to do, that I don't seek his face. And in response to that, he changes my heart. And in the church, he can change our church. A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Missionary Alliance Church, said, the chief danger of the church today is that It is trying to get on the same side as the world instead of turning the world upside down. By the way, that's what the the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the people were saying. That's what the disciples were doing. They're turning the world upside down. A.B. Simpson goes on to say, Our master expects us to accomplish results, even if they bring opposition and conflict. Anything is better than compromise, apathy, and paralysis. God give us an intense cry for the old time power of the gospel and the Holy Ghost. How does that come? It comes through prayer, through prayer. Now, before we get into this too deeply, I want to talk to you about revival. Anybody ever hear the term, we need revival? Hear people say that. I've heard it since the first time I probably ever went to church. I was Well, I went to church on and off a couple of times, but when I was 11, my parents got saved. And from that time until today, I hear people almost weekly talk about revival. Have you? Do we talk about it? Anybody want revival? Have you thought about what you really want? What do we mean when we say, God, give us revival? God, give us revival. I know what for a lot of people, what they think when they're talking about revival. They think, God, give us the same worship habits that we had when I was a little child 50 years ago. Make church services exactly like that. That's revival. Isn't that what they think sometimes? God, make revi- give us revival so that we can have services like we used to have. And so when they start having services like they used to have, they say, God has sent revival. And then until the next few months go by or whenever their next scheduled meeting is, uh, they don't experience revival. And then revival comes again. And So in their minds, that's what revival is. But in the Bible and in history, revival is much different than that. I would submit this definition of revival to you today. Revival is an outpouring of God's power, an outpouring of God's power in response to God's people glorifying him by seeking his face, which finally, finally results in multitudes being brought into the kingdom of God. You see, the end of revival is not some some uh, memory that I have of age gone by or not some th- something that I read about that God happened to do at this time in this place for those people. But at the end of the day, revival is when God's people seek his face and in response to God's people humbling, th- humbling themselves, praying, repenting, all of these things that we all know, when God does that, the end result of revival is always evangelism. Think about it. God sent us revival. Why? Because when you fire up your church, the multitudes are one. And when the multitudes are one, the church becomes stronger. And when the church becomes stronger, God gets more glory. Amen? And that's the goal. That's what we're after, getting God the glory. But sometimes we, uh, we individualize this thing called revival, right? Uh, how many of you grew up in a church other than this church? Most of you can raise your hand because this church is only seven years old, right? Right? <laughs> Uh, but growing up in a church, how many of you had grew up in a church where there was a prayer warrior or two or three? You know who I'm talking about. Those, usually it was an old lady or an old man, right? And it's like, if I'm dying, call brother so-and-so, call sister so-and-so, because it's like they had like a direct line to God. You know, they knew God like that, right? And so sometimes when we think of revival, we think, 
well, we as a church don't need revival. We just need to get these prayer warriors or these really spiritual people fired up, and somehow God's going to bring revival through them, and I'll just get the splash over. That's kind of how we approach it sometimes. But when I find revival in God's word, I find a united church, a unified church, a church that is pulling the same direction with the same intensity, not one that's divided and kind of doing their own things. And so what I'm saying is, God may send revival in your life if individually we just all pray for revival, a few of us here and there. But when the church begins to pray for revival together, evangelism happens organically, and God does some incredible, incredible things for us if we pull together. I think a good way to illustrate this is what Bob Bakke used in his illustration. Um, There's a picture up here of airplanes. Anybody recognize those airplanes? What era they're from? World War I, absolutely, Bob. Man, you're the history buff back there. World War I. During World War I, uh, airplanes were new, Bucky says. They were new and glamorous. Squadrons of planes would take off together and fly in formation until they encountered the enemy planes. Then pilots would dissipate in every direction to engage in aerial dogfights. And we, we love seeing footage of those things, don't we? It's amazing how they would do that. These sky duels became legendary covered by newspapers and garnering fame for the most skilled pilots with a scorecard of kills in their record, or to their record. But ironically, ironically, after World War I, the United States military almost concluded that the Air Force strategy for war was ineffective. Careful analysis revealed that while individual dogfighting was, great, was great for producing heroes and headlines, in terms of actually advancing the cause on the battlefield, it simply didn't work. The problem was only remediated when a decision was made to bring the Air Corps under military discipline that said, we're going to fly in formation and we're going to predetermine one target to hit and we're not going to divide up or turn back until that mission has been accomplished. That became the new creed for the Air Force, if you will. This simple shift in strategy turned air power into a deadly force. While no longer nearly as sensational Trading individual accolades for concerted action was well worth the gains on the field. That same shift, Bakke says, that same shift is desperately needed in Christian ministry today. Despite repeated pledges to work together as the body of Christ, often ministers, and I'll add lay people, the body, scatter in hundreds of directions and do thousands of different things. Of course, Many headlines are made and millions of dollars are raised. Great edifices and organizations are built and a select groups of, group of heroes emerge. But on a strategic macro level, on the big picture level, the kingdom of Christ is losing rather than taking ground in our culture. Why? Because sometimes we just like to have our own personal dogfights. We have to have a, we, we separate from each other and kind of do our thing here and there. But what he's saying is that when the military brought these planes together and said, we're going to stay together, we're going to focus together, we're going to go to one target together, we're going to make it happen, great things happen on the battlefield. Sometimes it's not nearly as flashy, is it, uh, when we unite our hearts together. And when you say, that people ask you, what kind of church do you go to? And you tell them, I go to a church that believes in prayer. No, no, what programs do you have? How big's your daycare? Or, or how large is your new building going to be? It's not really flashy to tell them, that, no, our church is dedicated to being the body. We're, we're, we're really a church that just wants to have community and to love each other and to love Christ and to welcome people into the kingdom of God. Sometimes it's, it's almost, compared to these other churches, almost a little embarrassing for us to say that. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, which one do you think glorifies God the most? I'm not saying they don't glorify God at all. But which one would glorify God the most when we do what he said together or when we try to have our own little dogfights separately? I believe that revival comes when the church unites together to seek God's face. When we seek his face, he moves with power when we do it together. Amen? Together is much better than alone. Together is much better than alone. I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. A lot of times when we talk about the early church, we always turn to Acts chapter 2, and that's good. Acts chapter 2 is a powerful, powerful story of what God did in the early church. But I want to show you something today in Acts chapter 4 
some, some characteristics of the church and what God was doing in the church and what he was doing through the church that I believe affects our understanding of how we ought to pray and how we ought to bind our hearts together in prayer for evangelism. Let me say it this way. If God is going to reach Mahoning County or Columbiana County or Stark County or Portage County or whichever county you happen to live in, if you don't live in those ones, if God is going to reach where you live and where I live, he's going to do it through believers seeking his face and in turn moving in regards or in response to that sacrifice of prayer. You believe that? God's going to do that. And so, again, when we look at Acts, the book of Acts in the early church, we sometimes look at Acts chapter 2 and how that they were in the upper room. When we get to the end of the, end of the verse there, end of the chapter, um, how that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and everything was happening and they were, they, were, they were sharing together in the apostles' teachings and in prayer and in all of these things. But then Acts chapter 4 gives us an even, I believe, a closer picture of what the church was all about. All right? So just follow along in your Bibles as I read. In the first three verses there in Acts chapter 4, we find a very busy church, a very busy church. It says, when Peter and John were speaking to the people, by the way, they were in the temple, they were, they were preaching, they were teaching. While they were pre- speaking to the people, they were confront, confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. The leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus Christ, there is a resurrection of the dead. That was the concise, boiled down version of their message that through Jesus Christ, there is a resurrection of the dead. It says they arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. So they were a busy church. What were they busy doing? What was the church doing? What? They were preaching the gospel. They weren't just huddled up in a room talking, uh, just, just singing of the glorious things of God. That's a good thing, but this church wasn't only doing that. Where did they find them? In the temple. Why were they in the temple? Because that's where everybody went, right? And so God was using them. They were a busy church. I believe that God wants CPC to be a church that is busy. There's a whole lot of churches that gather together in buildings much larger than this, sing their songs, hear their sermon, leave this place, and don't really act like the body of Christ. While we're together, they will sing kumbaya and hold hands. But the reality is, if we're busy, we are going to be about evangelism at some point. Amen? Evangelism at some point. They were not just a busy church, but they were a thriving church. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, and this, is, this is, might, might shock some of you, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. Shocking, isn't it? So the number of believers now totaled about how many? 5,000 men. <coughs> Does your version say that? 5,000 men, not counting women or children. If you look at that in the Greek, it's really saying 5,000 adult males. That's a big church. We thought megachurches were today, but this was happening back then, wasn't it? 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Do you think God really intends for churches to just struggle along? Anybody ever seen them? And I'm not making fun. Trust me, I'm not making fun. I've been a part of churches like that before. But is that really God's plan? I, I've, heard, I've heard some pastor friends of mine saying, well, I guess God just doesn't want to do anything where I am. No. Sometimes it's just simply reorganizing. Some, sometimes it's just simply doing things a little bit different. Sometimes it's just somebody different. I came here from a church, and my prayer is that whoever God brings to the church that I came from makes it explode. But for me, that wasn't me anymore. And that's where God moved me from there to here. And I don't know what God wants to do, but I do know this, that it's God's will that the church be thriving. Maybe not necessarily at this particular address or that particular address, but that the church be thriving. Amen? And what's thriving look like? Lots of money, a big building program? No. Thriving means souls are being brought into the kingdom. That's what it means. Souls are being brought into the kingdom of God. So we have a busy church, we have a thriving church, and we have a bold church. Look at verse 5. The next day the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other relatives of the high priest. Brought the whole family along, didn't they? They brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. We could almost just stop right there, but we won't. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, 
Are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? He was referring to the crippled man that he healed in Acts chapter 3. Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of who? Jesus Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified by whom but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Get this, there is salvation in no one else. You talk about having a guitar with one string. These guys didn't have PhDs, and we're going to find out in just a moment, this is what made them so bold. These guys didn't go to Bible college. They hadn't been to seminary. They didn't know that much about the, 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 the Bible, the Old Testament. These guys didn't have anything special about them, but they had one sermon, one song, one word. And really, when it comes to evangelism, that's all we need to do to let people know one thing, that there is resurrection from the dead through Jesus Christ. There's forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That one word, Jesus only, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as the men who had been with Jesus. But since, (laughs) get this, But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chambers and conferred among themselves. Hmm. How could they be so bold? How could they be so bold? How could they just stand there and say, we're not afraid, we're not ashamed to tell you that it's through Jesus that people are brought out of their lives of of sinfulness and darkness. Through Jesus, they can be healed. How could they be so bold? It's because they had a living, breathing illustration right there. Um, Some of you have heard of Andy Stanley, right? I'm sure Andy has. I tease him all the time. He likes Andy Stanley more than me. Uh, No, but uh, Andy Stanley, one day I read in one of his books and I thought, man, this guy's a genius. Uh, I read in one of his books, he was talking about the body of Christ. And I may have told you about this before. He's talking about the body of Christ and talking about how the fact that we need to be alive and connected. If we're a body part, a body part that's not connected is just weird, right? That's just creepy. If you see a hand or a foot or something not connected, that's just not good, right? And so for a sermon illustration, one day he took, he took this large glass of formaldehyde from a university professor that he knew or somebody, and he, and he put, I think it was a hand, inside this jar, and he set it up there for an illustration. I thought, man, that guy really knows how to use an illustration, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you'll never forget that if I bring a hand into the church. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. I'll have to study and see if I'm allowed to do that or not. Uh, But you talk about a living, breathing illustration. These guys were so confused and so confounded because the guy who was healed that they walked by for 40 years or however long it was, was standing right there. It doesn't say he was sitting right there, by the way. I don't know if that guy ever sat down again, right? I mean, his legs... We're healed. The Bible says when John, when, when, when Peter reached down and took him by the hand that he began leaping and dancing and praising God. Some of you are thinking of the children's song right now, aren't you? I can see it in your eyes. Why? Because God had healed him. And whose name was he healed in? Jesus. And so that's why Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, said, I'm not, I'm not even afraid to tell you. Everybody, listen. They want to know. Listen, everybody. I'll say it again. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. They were a bold church. I know that there's a miracle in every single person who comes to know Jesus Christ. And there's been many who've come to the Lord through this church, through the ministry of this church. How many of you have either been saved in this church or you've been saved as a result of people in this church investing in your lives? Anybody like that? There's some all over. So God's using that. I I think when when I read this, I'm sorry, and I know they're not here today, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but it's just thrilling to me, especially after yesterday. When I see Katie and Jeff standing here, The people around us, what can they argue with? There are people who don't like God at all. People who don't want anything to do with God. People who have written God off that look at their life and they've told me, what'd you do to them? I didn't do anything to them. What do you mean? How did that happen? This doesn't happen. Why? Because they've never seen the power of Jesus. Because they've never seen the power of Jesus. What the world needs is not more sermons. (laughs) 
What the world needs is not more churches. What the world needs is not more people with fish on their bumpers, on their cars. What the world needs is people who walk around with the presence of Jesus and change their life, to change their life, to change their world, and to make a difference. The church was bold. Are we bold? Are you bold as a Christian? Because if you're a Christian, you're the church, right? Are you bold? A lot of churches aren't bold because they're afraid to because there's no power there. Nobody's been saved. I mean, they can, they can literally go back into the annals of the church and say, 37 years ago, somebody got saved here. But when someone's been saved recently, isn't it amazing how that the, whoo, man, a breath of fresh air and something happens. And we're not afraid anymore. We're not backward anymore. But we'll boldly stand on any street corner and say, God's doing something. Jesus changed lives. There is resurrection through Jesus Christ. They were bold. It says they were baffling. It was a baffling church. It confused them. Look at verse 16. What should we do to these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it, even without Facebook and Twitter. But to keep them from spreading their pro- propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in what? Jesus' name. They knew where the power was at, didn't they? So they called the apostles back and then commanded them, Never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. You ever had that problem? Spending a lot of time with somebody? And after a while, you just just can't help it. You got to bring up Jesus. You... You know, you've talked about football, and that didn't last very long. You talked about the weather, that didn't last very long. You talked about your job, your family, your kids. But Jesus just comes up. You can't help it. Why? Because just like the apostles, he said, we can't stop telling about what we've heard and what we've seen. I'm reminded of John when he said those things that we have heard and seen, we, we, we relay to you, we give to you. Why? Because we're witnesses of these things. I can't stop because I've witnessed what God has done. Amen? I've witnessed what he's done, and so we can't stop telling people about Jesus. The council then threatened them further. (coughs) Pretty weak, isn't it? They threatened them further, but finally they let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone, get this, for everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. That's a big dilemma, isn't it? They were a baffling church. How do we stop this? How do we get them to stop? They're changing everything. Just like last week, the early church was talking about, it's gone everywhere. We can't find anybody who hasn't heard about Jesus, that he was buried and resurrected and he's not in the tomb anymore. We can't find anybody who hasn't been told. Oh, that God would make CPC a baffling church to where people, and and it is in some ways, right? Andy just told me the other day, someone asked him, and, and people have asked me, what's your secret? You know, these pastors are like, your church is growing. What's your secret? They want a silver bullet, right? They they want some secret that's going to give them some church growth idea that make it happen there. You know what I tell them? We're just seeking God and being faithful to love each other and to be the the body. We don't have any secrets. If you find a secret, let us know. But the only secret we have is to love God and to be the body of Christ, how he wants us to be. That's all the secret we have. We don't have any money. We're broke. Ask our treasurer. No, we're not broke. We're not broke. Uh, but, but we have, God gives us just enough to, to, that we need, right? We're not a rich church. We're not a, we're not a super talented church, right? We don't have Chris Tomlin leading our singing. We have Andy though. That's better, right? <laughs> I'm picking on you today. I better stop. Somebody over here, raise your hand if you want to. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of things that other churches ha- have. We don't have billboards yet. I'd like to have a billboard just to put on there that Jesus loves you, not necessarily about our church. But what's our secret? Our secret is there's lame people getting healed spiritually. I'd like to see the day the Lord does it physically if he wants to. Look, bring somebody in here, heal them. Why? Because you know what that's going to do? It's going to fill this church with people that want to know what in the world's happening around there. You mean to tell me that, that you know, you're, you're the same people that you used to be, but yet look at where you are now? Yeah, why? Because Jesus because Jesus. They were a baffling church. They were a unified church. Look at verse 23. As soon as they were freed, get this, they they leave this nice courtroom, (laughs) Peter and John. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to where? 
the other believers. They went home, right? And they told them what the leading priests and elders had said. And when they heard the, re- the report, how many of the believers? All the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. I want you to think about that for just a second. Peter and John leave jail. They say, stop preaching in the name of Jesus, or they're going to threaten, they're threatening them and tell them all the stuff they're going to do. And I almost chuckle when I read that because it's like, what are you going to do? Or else what, right? And so they go back into the church. They go back to the church. And remember, this isn't just a huddled group of three or four or five or 10 people. This is 5,000 men plus women and children. This is a mega church. That church, that, that, that city didn't have any hope of not hearing about Jesus, right? So they go back to the church. And the Bible says when they got back there, they told them what they were told. And what did the church do? Immediately, all of them. All of them. Can you imagine that? Just think about that for a moment. All of them lifted their voice to God. All of them began to pray together to God. And if you have a Bible... um, Well, we better not do that because some of you probably have different translations. Let me just read the prayer that they prayed to God, right? They just got threatened. If you keep doing this, we're going to have, there's going to be bad consequences. Listen to what they prayed. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry, and why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle, and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city, for Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate the governor, and the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord... Hear their threats and give us, your servants, what? Freedom from all of these problems? Give us, your servants, a million dollars endowment? What did he say? Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And I don't know if God heard this because they didn't say amen right there but I'm just going to add it. Amen. Amen. Amen? So we say, God, stretch out your hand. God, give us boldness to preach the gospel. And God, by the way, give us some more of those living illustrations. Amen? Not so that people say, wow, that church is great, but so that they look at God and say, God, you are glorious. God, you are awesome. God, you are high. You are lifted up. A unified church. You didn't have this group of people over on this side saying, oh, we're praying for our ministry and they're praying for their ministry and we're doing this. But they were saying, God, together, give us boldness that together we can rise up and glorify your name. They were a united church. I better hurry up. They were also uh, not just a unified church, but they were a Bible-centered church. In verses 24 through 26, the first part of, or rather the last part of 24, we find that they're quoting scripture. Where did they get that from? Well, they were in the word. What word? They didn't have the New Testament. They are the New Testament. They were looking into the Old Testament. They were a Bible-centered church. Number seven, they were a focused church. Look at verse 27. In fact, this has happened right here in this very city. What were they concerned about? Were they praying generally or were they praying specifically? In this city, right here, God, we need you to do something. I believe God wants us to be a focused church. Amen? Amen. God, I I know that you want to do something in Africa, and I know that you want to do something in India, and I know that you want to do all these things, and we pray for these countries, right? We're all part of the the body, but at the same time, we need to say, God, I want you to do something right here, right here in Beloit. Last I looked, there were 995 houses in Beloit at the last census. 995, I'm sorry, 995 people, not houses. Some of you are like, where are they hiding them? (laughs) 995 people at the last census, a little over 2,000, I believe, in Sebring. You know what our prayer ought to be? God's planted us right here. Our prayer ought to be, God, we need you to do something right here. Salem, Alliance, North Benton. Some of you are coming from Lisbon, West Point, the big metropolis down there. All over the place, there's places, there's, there's cities, there's, there's people. And so our prayer needs to be focused What God did in Jerusalem was not just something that he only wanted to do in Jerusalem. He wants to do that here. 
He wants to do that where you live, and he wants to do it where I live. Look at verse 31. It says, after this prayer, what prayer? The prayer for the power of God to move, the prayer for boldness and evangelism. After this prayer is when this happened. After this prayer, the meeting place shook. (laughs) What would happen if God would shake this building? Are we willing to pray until he shakes it? Because you see, none of this boldness came until after they prayed. We talk about revival. We sing about revival. People write books about revival. We have revivals. But the only time revival comes, the only time God shakes things up is when the people pray. You want to know what the the most important activity of our church calendar ought to be? Times when the church gathers and prays. I think it was Jim Symbol that said that uh, if you, uh, you can go to a church on a Sunday morning to find out how popular the church is, you go to a church on Sunday night and find out how popular the pastor is. By the way, attendance is going up, so I'm getting, getting good, right, on Sunday? No, I'm just teasing. Uh, but you go to a church on a prayer meeting time, and then you find out how popular Jesus is. Does that mean we don't pray at home and people can't, they have to be? No, I'm just saying, if the church isn't praying, revival isn't coming. And if revival isn't coming, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. They were a filled church. A filled church. Why? Because they prayed for God's power. They prayed for God's presence. They prayed for boldness for the ultimate, the ultimate result of reaching the lost. Lastly, they prayed, uh, or that rather they were a faithful church. The second half of 31, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So they were filled and then they preached the word of God with boldness. So in other words, they didn't pray and ask God for something and then sit there and twiddle their thumbs saying, uh, God, you got anything else you want to send? <laughs> right? We do that sometimes. We say, God, give us revival. But you know what happens if he gives us revival? Our lives change. Our church changes. Amen? Our dreams and ambitions and all of our hobbies and some of these things in our life are going to have to change in order for revival to fit into our plan, right? They were a faithful church. They prayed for it, God gave it, and they took it and did it. They did it. Oh, that God would help us to pray until we're committed to doing what we say that we want him to do. Let me close with this. Sometimes we talk about revival and we we look, you know, we look back into the Bible days and we see 5,000 men plus women and children and all of these things that were happening, 3,000 in one service. Man, that was a baptizing machine church, wasn't it? You just have to have church right in the water, just baptize them as they come, come to church. Uh, but we look at this, and sometimes we're kind of turned off, and we think, wow, I've never seen anything like that. Let me tell you what happened just a little over 150 years ago, all right? And interestingly enough, it did not happen by a preacher. It did not, it did not begin with a preacher. It did not begin with a a uh, someone with a doctorate degree in theology, okay? Listen to this story. This is a record of something God did 130 years ago in New York City. It illustrates how that God started every harvest time in history through the concerted prayer of his people. Toward the middle of the last century, the globe, the early religious awakenings, the great awakenings, you probably read about those, in the 1700s, had faded away. America was prosperous. Sound familiar? America was prosperous and felt, a little need, felt little need to call on God. But in the 1950s, secular and religious conditions combined to bring about a crash. The third great panic in American history swept through the giddy structure of speculative wealth. Or it swept it away. Thousands of merchants were forced to the wall as banks failed and railroads went into bankruptcy. Factories were shut down and vast numbers thrown out of employment. New York City alone, having 30,000 men who were idle with no work. In October 1857, the hearts of the people were thoroughly weaned from speculation and uncertain gain, while hunger and despair stared them in the face. On the 1st of July, 1857, a quiet and zealous businessman named Jeremiah Lamphere took up an appointment 
as a city missionary in downtown New York. Lamphere was appointed by the North Church of the Dutch Reformed denomination. This church was suffering from depletion of membership due to the removal of the population from the downtown to the better residential quarters, and the new, new city missionary was engaged trying to make diligent visitation in the midst of, immediate, of the immediate neighborhood with a view to enlisting the church attendance among the floating population of the no lower New York City. The Dutch consistory felt that it had appointed the ideal layman for the task in hand, and so it was. Burdened so by the need, Jeremiah Lamphere decided to invite others to join him in a noonday prayer meeting to be held on Wednesday once a week. He therefore distributed a handbill, How Often Shall We Pray? It was very, very popular. He just said that every Wednesday from 12, p 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., we're going to pray together, okay? According, accordingly, at 12 noon on 23rd of September, 1857, the door was opened, and the faithful Lampier took his seat to await the response to his invitation. Five minutes went by. No one appeared. The missionary paced from the room in a conflict of fear and faith. Ten minutes elapsed. Still no one came. Fifteen minutes passed. Lampier was let al yet alone. 20 minutes, 25, 30, and then at 12.30, a step was heard on the stairs, and the first person appeared, then another, and another, another, and another, until six people were present, and the prayer meeting began. On the following Wednesday, there were 40 intercessors. Thus, in the week of the first week of October, 1857, it was decided to hold a meeting daily instead of weekly. Get this, within six months... Within six months, 10,000 businessmen were gathering daily for prayer in New York. And within two years, a million converts were added to the American churches. Why? Because one guy said, I'm going to pray. Undoubtedly, the greatest revival in New York's colorful history was sweeping the city. And it was such an order to make the whole nation curious. There was no fanaticism, no hysteria, simply an incredible movement of the people to pray. In 1858, a leading Methodist paper reported these features of the, of the revival, this revival that was spreading because of this prayer meeting. All across the nations, people were praying, by the way. Um, by March, the newspapers carried the front page reports of 6,000 attending prayer meetings in New York, 6,000 of them over here in Pittsburgh. Daily prayer meetings were held in Washington at five different times to accommodate the crowds. By May, 50,000 of New York's 800,000 people were new converts. You talk about a discipleship program. 50,000 of 800,000 were brand new converts. A newspaper reported that New England was profoundly changed by the revival in several towns, had no unconverted adults to be found in them. Wow. In 1858, a leading Methodist paper reported these features of the revival. Here's what they said, and I'll leave you with this. Few sermons were needed. Lay people witnessed. Seekers flocked to the altar. Nearly all seekers were blessed. Experiences remained clear. Converts had holy boldness. Religion became a social topic. Family altars were strengthened. Testimony given nightly was abundant. And conversations were marked with seriousness. Anybody long for those days? When society is affected by the church rather than the church being affected by society. When people look to the church for hope and for help rather than just viewing us as a club or a gathering of people who aren't serious at times about what we say we're serious about. Edwin Orr's research revealed that in 1858, 1859, over a million Americans were converted in a population of only 30 million. A million in a population of 30 million. And at least a million Christians were renewed in their faith with lasting results in church attendances and moral reform in society. I have a sneaking suspicion that perhaps even the fact that there is a church here could be tied somehow to these revivals that were happening, the fact that there was a church at this particular property over the years. What if it was tied to that? What does God want to do 150 years from now? What will people read about your church, about Connecting Point Chapel? What difference will we make in eternity, whether we were here, whether we weren't? What about your family? If people read about you 150 years from now, will they say that God did a mighty work because you sought his face? Or will they say, wow, 
was a good person. He was a nice person. They did a lot of things. My prayer and my desire is that God would use me. I want revival. But the reason I want revival is not for nostalgia. The reason I want revival is because I want to see God reach this world. I want to see the glory of God spread across this world. He can do it again. Do you believe that? He can do it again. And all it takes is you or me or someone else that will say, God, I want to seek your face. Even if nobody else shows up, I want to seek your face. And when that happens, when that happens, when we seek his face, God will begin to move as he's doing here. And as he moves, souls will be added to the kingdom. That's the evidence of knowing that God is working. That's the evidence of knowing that God is working. And so I just ask you this morning as we, let's just stand together uh, as we wrap up today. I ask you to join me in joining the church in Jerusalem and asking God for boldness. Why do you think they ask God for boldness? The reason they ask him for boldness is because they didn't have it. It's because at times they were timid. The reason they asked for boldness is because they knew that if they preached, they would be uncomfortable. That if they shared Jesus and spoke in his name, that there would be opposition. And sometimes that's the very reason we don't. But I believe that God wants to give us boldness. Amen? He wants to give us boldness. And so let's just bow our heads and our hearts before him and uh, ask him for boldness. Perhaps it's boldness to turn your back on things that are distracting you. Perhaps that's not your issue, but your boldness is, is speaking to that person that you know God wants you to talk to, he wants you to witness to, but you're just not sure how they're going to react to it, not sure what they're going to say, not sure how they'll make you feel. But we say, God, give us boldness to do your will, and as you impress it upon our heart, help us to have boldness to obey and to be what you want us to be. Father, you are sovereign, as the early church said. What a blessing it is to read their prayer and to think that we can also unite our hearts and our minds around one theme, and that is to build your kingdom. God, I believe that this picture that we see in Acts chapter 4 is the picture that you want your church to look like. That in the midst of opposition, in the midst of problems, and no, they were not perfect, as we see in the next chapters, there were issues uh, in their church. They were not perfect, but they did one thing right. And that is they were united in saying, God, we want to let the whole world know that Jesus saves. And so God, I pray that you would give us boldness. Give us boldness as individuals, that we would walk through every door that you open for us, that we would take the opportunity every single time that you give us to share our faith, recognizing that this is the plan. This is why Jesus came to redeem mankind. And if we keep that to ourselves, we are, the, we are, the, we are the, the, the worst of all for not sharing the most valuable of all. Lord, I pray that you would help our families. Give us boldness in our families. Give us a revival of, of family altars where we gather together and where we pray together, where we seek your face together, where we read your word together. Lord, help us to not be ashamed, but may we be people who openly and, and blatantly confess Jesus to the world around us. Make our families testimonies of what God's done in our lives and in our homes. And use us, Lord, to bring people into your, into your kingdom. Use our families. And then, Lord, I pray for our church. Give us boldness. Lord, we're really not actively uh, reaching out with an outreach program necessarily like a lot of other churches. And we know that you want to use us. And we know that in the future there's going to be things that we're going to do together to reach this community and so, God, I pray that you would give us boldness for when that time comes and that you would give us understanding and wisdom to know how to best reach them, how to best connect with them, and how to best bring them into your kingdom. God, I pray that you would expand our borders, that you would expand our hearts, expand our arms, that we would be able to reach around even more people who need to be loved into the kingdom of God and to be brought into the fellowship of his body. Lord, we pray for boldness. We have many needs, but God, the biggest need that we confess to you today is that we need your boldness to share, to share your word, to share Jesus Christ, and to take a lost and dying world and bring them to the light of the Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.